I had no idea, nor did Mark Saylor know, how many times have I said this in the 30 years that we've, 31 years we've, let me think, 31, uh, next month that we've shared the platform together of what the song service would be, and he didn't know the title of the message, uh, what it was going to be, but the title of the message today is The Sovereignty of God on Display. And song after song we sang, including, O Father, You Are Sovereign, dealt with this very subject, guess who knew? <laughs> oh my, it does my heart well to see uh, these kinds of uh, providences uh, on display, the sovereignty of God on display. Three weeks ago, we began our verse-by-verse study through the book of Numbers. We've seen that the subject matter deals with the children of Israel coming out of Egypt That's the Exodus. And then the numbering of the people who came out, as well as later in the book, much later in the book, the numbering of the people who would go into the promised land. We've learned that the book was written by Moses. We learned that some 150 times in this book, 36 chapters, but three of the chapters don't include this. So in 33 of those chapters, Uh, 150 times, there's some reference to God having communicated to Moses. Not quite an average of five times a chapter. We're getting it all the time, in other words, that the Lord spoke unto Moses. Last week, we covered verses 1 through 19 in the first chapter, which lists the names of the tribes, the leaders of the tribes, whom God chose, who would be the ones to help Moses and Aaron do the head count of the war-worthy men, those who are 20 years of age and up. And I'll tell you, I I am getting more jazzed about the book of Numbers every week. And a number of you, uh, a number of you, many of you (laughs) have said the the same thing to me, and and I really am. I'm just uh, seeing uh, uh, the Lord in in a new uh, or a new and a fresh light. We learn that God issues specific calls to specific people for specific purposes, yea, He is sovereign. And so today, we continue that theme of the sovereignty of God, and we see it on display in a little different way uh, than uh, uh, what we would, uh, uh, what you might anticipate as we read our text today, chapter 1, verses 20 through 54. If you would look at that, um, and we're going to read it really starting in verse 18, and it's very quick read uh, because 12 times it basically says the same thing, uh, 13 times actually, uh, 13 times uh, because of uh, uh, Joseph, uh, his two uh, sons. Uh, but, uh, but we're going to uh, look at God's sovereign hand in this. Chapter 1 of Numbers, verse 18. And they assembled all the congregation together on the first day of the second month, and they declared their lineages... Lineage, lineages after their family by the house of their fathers according to the number of the names from 20 years old and upward by their poles. In other words, they assembled. <clears throat> you, tw- you guys who are 20 and up, you come on out here, we're going to count you. As the Lord commanded Moses, so he numbered them in the wilderness of Sinai. And the children of Reuben, Israel's eldest son, by their generations after their families by the house of their fathers, According to the number of the names by their poles, every male from 20 years old and upward, all who were able to go forth to war. Those who were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Reuben, were 40 and 6,500. Of the children of Simeon, by their generations, after their families, by the house of their fathers, those who were numbered of them, according to the number of the names, by their poles, every male from 20 years old and upward, all who were able to go forth to war, those who were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Simeon, were 50 and 9,300. Of the children of Gad, by their generations, after their families, by the house of their fathers, according to the number of the names from 20 years uh, old and upward, all who were able to go forth to war, those who were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Gad, were 40 and 5,650. Of the children of Judah, <clears throat> by their generations, after their families, by the house of their fathers, according to the number of the names from 20 years old and upward, all who were able to go forth to war, those who were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Judah, were threescore and 14,600. Of the children of Issachar, 
by their generations, after their families, by the house of their fathers, according to the number of the names, from 20 years old and upward, all who were able to go forth to war. Those who were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Issachar, were 50 and 4,400. Now, parenthetically, you all are saying, don't read every one of these. It says the same thing, just substitutes the name of the tribe. And it does. And yet, what all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And all of it is profitable for doctrine. And folks, I'm just not smart enough to know any better way than to believe that all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, proof, correction, instruction. I'm not going to be one of those who, uh, who has a better idea, a better way of doing things. Uh, but we're going to laboriously, to a degree, tediously, even maybe if we uh, let the flesh get in the way, read through these. Where was I before I so rudely interrupted myself? Verse 30, of the children of Zebulun, <clears throat> by their generations, after their families, by the house of their fathers, according to the number of their names, of the names, from 20 years old and upward, all who were able to go forth to war, those who were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Zebulun, were 50 and 7,400. Of the children of Joseph, namely, of the children of Ephraim, by their generations, after their families, by the house of their fathers, according to the number of the names, from 20 years old and upward, all who were able to go forth to war, those who were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Ephraim, were 40,500. Of the tribe of Manasseh, by their generations, after their families, by the house of their fathers, according to the number of the names, from 20 years old and upward, all who were able to go forth to war, those who were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Manasseh, were 30 and 2,200. Of the, tri- of the children of uh, Benjamin, by their generations, after their families, by the house of their fathers, according to the number of the names, from 20 years old and upward, all who were able to go forth to war, those who were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Benjamin, were 30 and 5,400. Of the children of Dan, by their generations, after their families, by the house of their fathers, according uh, to the number of the names, from 20 years old and upward, all who were able to go forth to war, those who were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Dan, were threescore, 2,700. Of the children of Asher, by their generations, after their families, by the house of their fathers, according to the number of the names, from, all, from 20 years old and upward, all who were able to go forth to war, those who were numbered of them, even of the tribe of Asher, were 40 and 1,500. <clears throat> of the children of Naphtali, throughout their generations, after their families, by the house of their fathers, according to the number of their names, the, uh, from 20 years old and upward, all who were able to go forth to war, those who were numbered of them, even the tribe of Naphtali, were 50 and 3,400. <clears throat> These are those who were numbered, from uh, whom Moses and Aaron numbered, and the princes of Israel, being 12 men, each one was for the house of his fathers. So were all those who were uh, numbered, the children of Israel, by the house of their fathers from 20 years old and upward, all who were able to go forth to war in Israel. Even all they uh, who were numbered were 600,000 <clears throat> and 3,000 and 500 and 50. That is 603,550. But the Levites, after the tribe of their fathers, were not numbered among them. For the Lord had spoken unto Moses, saying, Only thou shalt not number the tribe of Levi, neither take the sum of them among the children of Israel, but thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of testimony, and over all the vessels thereof, and over all the things that belong to it. They shall bear the tabernacle and all the vessels thereof, and they shall minister unto it, and shall encamp round about the tabernacle. And when the tabernacle setteth forward, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up. And the stranger who cometh near shall be put to death. And the children of Israel shall pitch their tents, every man by his own camp, uh, and every man by his own standard throughout their hosts. But the Levites shall encamp round about the tabernacle of testimony, that there be no wrath uh, upon the children of uh, the congregation of the children of Israel. And the Levites shall keep the charge of the tabernacle of testimony. And the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so did they. <clears throat> As you can see uh, in verse, from verse 46, in verse 46, the whole total headcount uh, of the war-worthy men over the age of 20 was 603,550. <clears throat> Or was it? Or was it? There has been a lot of debate. Uh, I didn't know this was an issue. Folks, I went in to drain the swamp 
and I'm up to my neck in alligators <laughs> in the book of Numbers. One verse after another, one chapter after another, I did not know there was uh, as much disagreement and controversy in this book as I am discovering. Well, here is another one. And the issue has to do, the elephant in the room has to do with the huge number. This is over a half a million war-worthy young men, uh, nearly two-thirds of a million, which means when you add the older men, all the children and teenagers, all the females, you have two to three million head count of individual souls who came out of Egypt, went through the miracle of the Red Sea, landed at Sinai, and have planted it there, and now end up going to be wandering around in the wilderness. Is that actually the number and actually the head count? Well, I didn't have any reason to, to wonder about it before. Uh, suffice it to say, though, this controversial issue um, has people on all over the place and some even use it, not, 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 not all, not even most. Some use it to mock the credibility of Scripture. I came across one <clears throat> who is right on the edge of that, uh, and he, uh, he takes a very harsh look at this. Uh, <clears throat> Martin Noth, from 75 years ago or so, said the main problem of the section 1, 20 to 46 consists in the figures that are given. Their size, as is generally recognized, lies outside of the sphere of what is historically acceptable. In no sense do they bear even a tolerable relationship to what we otherwise know of the strength of military conscription in the ancient East. Now, he takes a, a very negative light and kind of has the flavor of this is an error. It's not an error. Uh, the, the error might be in our understanding. And I'm still holding, uh, uh, I'm still holding uh, my cards pretty tight to what this actually means. Uh, Pastor Skirbina and I uh, have been wrestling with this for a couple of weeks. I've been driving him crazy, I'm sure. And uh, I've asked him, we're, we're going to do something uh, a bit unusual. In fact, I don't know in the um, 1980 to 1924, in the 44 years then I've been a part of Redbridge. I don't know if I've ever seen done what we're going to do, Lord willing, next Sunday morning. And that is we're going to tag team. Uh, you remember All-Star Wrestling? How when the, when the one guy is just ready to get pinned, uh, he, he, he tags out and you're like, you guys understand what I'm talking about? Come on, go ahead and identify yourselves. <laughs> well, that's what we're going to do. We're going to tag team next Sunday morning. Um, and uh, and uh, Garrett is truly uh, as much an expert as I know on this issue. And it doesn't have to do at all. It's not a compromising issue. Uh, it's not a Bible denying issue to come up with another number. It's the meaning of the particular word for thousands. And there are multiple uses uh, for that very word, that very specific word, and uh, how we can uh, really try to get some kind of an idea. It doesn't have any bearing at all. Well, I say no bearing uh, on, uh, on uh, <coughs> what we believe uh, uh, about the, the things of God and all. It might just add more enlightenment to it. So that's, uh, uh, hopefully that will be uh, next week. Uh, so I'm not going to really deal with it to any great degree today at all. I've emphasized, though, the point in Numbers that the Lord is calling the shots. He's the one who said, come on, Moses, go on down to Egypt land. I'll, I want my people to head out. And they did. Uh, and uh, he's the one who said, identify the leaders of the various tribes and have them help you do the head count of war-worthy men. And they did. And it brings us to this point uh, today here in chapter 1, the completion uh, of chapter 1, that really I want us to emphasize, I, I want to emphasize, I want you to realize afresh and anew of the sovereignty of God. He rules in the kingdom of men. And that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar uh, came to understand in Daniel chapter 4, verses 35 um, and uh, 35 to, uh, 34 and 35. And at the end of the days, that is after Nebuchadnezzar went and lived like an animal for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar lifted up, uh, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes into heaven 
And this is his own testimony. Uh, my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. I praised and honored him that lives, for, that lives forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants, inhabitants of the earth are reputed or considered nothing compared to God. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? In other words, Nebuchadnezzar came to the realization, God is sovereign. This is the king of the empire. This is the emperor of the Babylonian empire. And yet he was made uh, to, to act and behave like an animal for years, be out in the field uh, eating grass, and his, his fingernails grew like claws, and, and he was an absolute wreck. And then at the end of those days, after the judgment was done, he came to his senses, God allowed him to come to his senses, and he made this declaration, God is sovereign over all. Don't monkey with the Lord, is what Nebuchadnezzar uh, was saying in our vernacular. So let's talk about, just for a moment, uh, the sovereignty of God on display. First of all, the sovereignty of God was on display in choosing Israel. And that begs the question, what is meant actually by sovereignty? The sovereignty of God. Well, simply stated, it means that God has reserved to himself and for himself the right to choose the what, the when, the where, the why, and the how of all he does. Things don't happen by accident with the Lord. Things, it, it, it didn't catch, nothing catches him off guard. Nothing surprised the Lord. He cannot gain in information and knowledge. Uh, he, uh, he is overseeing uh, and directing the affairs of the universe. And yes, even the evil things which take place, he's not culpable for them, but he is certainly, at least at the very minimum, allowing that in his sovereignty. So in God's sovereignty, uh, he is the one who is ruling and reigning. I like a very simplistic definition that I, I got from gotquestions.org. The fact that God is sovereign essentially means that he has the power and wisdom and authority to do anything he chooses. And even when God does not visibly display his sovereignty in a particular situation, he is sovereign in not displaying his sovereignty. Did you all follow that? For instance, uh, when a, a, a God-fearing uh, person, uh, uh, one of, uh, one of your, your, your family members or friends, and, and someone who loves the Lord and, and is Christ-centered and, and is a Bible believer, when that person is, is struck down, maybe in a moment or maybe he's struck with cancer, maybe suffers for a long time, has God lost his sovereignty? No. He just simply is displaying it in allowing suffering to go on because he is in his sovereignty. He's all wise, so he's not making a mistake. He's all powerful, so he could uh, intervene in another way if he wanted. But it's because of his wisdom he's chosen to intervene in this way. Did you all follow that? Have you, have you had any losses in your life? Have you had any heartache in your life? God was still on the throne during that time, just as he demonstrated to Job, uh, uh, 30, uh, so 37 chapters of Job vacillating and at times standing strong, uh, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Uh, and uh, his wife saying to him, curse God and die, and his three friends accusing him and all the rest. And at times Job was wavering, where is, where, oh God, where are you in this? And in those chapters, in chapter 38, 39, 40, God said, this is who I am. This is what I've done. Now you, uh, you, explain, uh, you explain my ways. And of course, Job said, I am undone. I'm coming apart of the seams. Who, who am I to ever have questioned God and his wisdom in acting in this world? So <clears throat> God is sovereign. He does whatever he wants to do according to his power, wisdom, and authority. Um, and no one should challenge that. And so the sovereignty of God on display in choosing Israel. Well, Deuteronomy 7 speaks to it. He does give us a little bit of insight. Verses 6 through 9. For thou art a holy people, talking to Israel, unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So we see, and we see back in Genesis 
that God specifically chose Israel above all other people groups, all other ethnicities, above Americans, uh, above uh, any, any other people group you can name who are upon the face of the earth. And then he qualifies it. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you are the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, um, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house uh, of bondage, um, uh, redeemed you uh, uh, out of the house of uh, bondage, I think, I think it should say, uh, or bondmen, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And so we see that the sovereignty of God is not based upon them, their power, their strength, their might, uh, might, but simply because he determined to set his love upon this ethnicity. And folks, doesn't that sound, doesn't that ring loud in your heart about being the individual believer? Amen. He didn't choose you because he would see that you would be righteous one day. He would see, what, well, boy, I got to get in on this. Uh, uh, I have to make a good catch now so that, uh, uh, because so-and-so is really going to serve. No, no, no. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He chose us on eternity past. He determined to set his love upon it. Why? Ephesians 1, according to the good pleasure of his will. He is sovereign in all he does. He was sovereign in choosing Israel as his ethnic people. And then we can surmise from this, the sovereignty of God was on display in challenging or testing Israel, putting them through the test. The ethnic people of God were in bondage in Egypt for some 400 years. And, and really, I, I, all week long, I've been, in studying this and thinking about it, I've been asking why, and I've been looking at uh, commentaries and, uh, and trying, to, trying to discern why is it that God allowed Israel to be in Egypt for those 400 years? And really, the closest answer uh, that I've come to is found in Genesis 15, 13, 16, uh, which is a reaffirmation of the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, God said, I, uh, I've chosen you. He said unto Abram, know of a surety, know certainly, that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them. Well, that certainly was fulfilled with Egypt. And they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. And of course, we know from the book of Exodus that when they left Egypt, they were, they were heavy uh, with gold and uh, uh, various uh, uh, maybe farming uh, 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 equipment and clothing and, uh, and all the rest. They're going to come out with, with a lot of booty is really the idea. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Um, thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Talking about Moses, you're 120 years old. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. That is, Israel's going to come out of Egypt into the promised land, but not yet. Why? For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Well, what is that? That is saying. It's saying uh, that God seemingly, uh, uh, if you put the, the negative uh, understanding on it, <clears throat> God's going to let them store up more wrath, that is the inhabitants of the promised land, until one day there, there's going to be <clears throat> a complete annihilation. Do we have any Amorites? <clears throat> is there an Amorite village? Uh, how about of the Malachite? How about of the Jebusite? How about of a, a Hittite? No, no, no. All of them are long gone. Those civilizations were swamped over and extinguished, really. So it could be uh, that, uh, that the Lord's saying, that all of their iniquity has not come to a, a full level yet, uh, but when it does, uh, then wrath is going to come. Or it could say, you could say that God is going to be merciful for another 400 years and let the heavens declare the glory of God. Romans 1, uh, 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 Psalm 19, confirmed in Romans 1. That the conscience of man uh, uh, will, uh, will, will prick the heart over sin and idolatry and all the rest so that there might be 
one or a hundred or a thousand or a million, whatever in that amount of time, who will turn in faith to the Lord? Did anyone ever turn in faith to the Lord during that time? Just preached on Rahab a few weeks ago. I think it was on Mother's Day. A model, an example to follow. There's one. There's one who uh, lived in that pagan culture during the end of that time who did, in fact, turn in faith. And uh, presumably her whole household uh, because there were many who came underneath her roof uh, and were sheltered by the scarlet, uh, the scarlet thread that, uh, that basically said to the Israelite army, hands off. You all follow what I'm talking about here? So uh, there, was some, there was something that God wanted to accomplish in those 400 years of testing, of challenging Israel. Now, you say, that, uh, that is a harsh test for the chosen people of God. Well, if you're a believer, you're a chosen child of God. Do you face tests? Do you face challenges in your life? Right? Amen? Anybody here have, it's just been smooth sailing, no issues in your entire life so far. You know, you, you, uh, you, <laughs> you're born wet, cold, and naked, and you end up in worse shape, you know? So, <laughs> all of us have challenges. No, maybe not 400 years in Egypt, but there's something. Uh, I'm looking out over you some right now. Some of you have chronic health issues uh, that almost can be all-consuming if you didn't have your eyes on the Lord. You have losses in life. And as I shared earlier, uh, Brother Sean called me Wednesday uh, evening, uh, and he had found his his dad um, uh, who had already died hours earlier. uh, And uh, and, and just how, 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 uh, just that just shatters your soul, doesn't it? And Bill and Jennifer, I think of you. Jennifer, how many times have you had malaria and dengue fever? About, about 97 or something? A, a number of times, right? In, in 21 years. Bill, did you ever get that? I thought maybe you were too mean to get that. I didn't, I didn't know. <clears throat> Stuff happens to God's people. And yet he is sovereign overall. He has a purpose down the road. Or maybe even in the midst of it, in the here and now. For no rhyme or reason related to, to that person, pop, possibly. And so he still works in that way. Also, Ezekiel chapter 20, we won't look at it now, but it details this. Uh, it gives the chronology of this, and it indicates <clears throat> that God was going to be patient uh, with the Amorites, but in the midst of being in Egypt, paganism uh, ha- had. Uh, crept into the lives of those of Israel. And God was working that out uh, during that time. So either way, he does it for his own glory. The sovereignty of God, and I hear this, uh, the sovereignty of God does not rattle me, does not challenge, the best I know. If it does, I don't know that it does. In fact, uh, I I find, I, I, I don't have an aversion to the sovereignty of God. I have an affinity for the sovereignty of God. Because when I think of the sovereignty of God, that is, he does according to his will in the kingdom of men. I am comforted by that. I am secure by that. I can remember when I was about five or six years old. Remember the old Uptown Theater, which was downtown? But anyway, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> back in the early 60s, uh, I went and saw the movie Pinocchio. And <clears throat> with my family. And uh, my dad was going to go get the car for my mom and my two sisters and myself. And I was probably five or something along, along that line. Uh, and I remember it was so bitter cold that particular night. It was an evening showing up Pinocchio that your, my tears were, it felt like it was free, they were freezing on my face. I was crying because it was so cold. And yet my dad... Uh, grabbed me <clears throat> and took me with him uh, to go get the car and left my mom and two sisters uh, in the theater while they waited for it. Now, why did he do that? Because I was a rascal, <laughs> right? You can see that, right? <laughs> and, and so Melody and my uh, younger sister uh, stayed in the warmth of the theater while I walked blocks and it seemed like miles uh, with my dad at eight at night in zero degree weather 
with me crying and, and the like. Until he picked me up and I nestled my face in his shoulder in his, in his coat in parka. It was as if it was heaven for a five-year-old. That's how I feel about the sovereignty of God. I really do. I get a sense of comfort and security and hope and assurance that he's got this. Amen? God has this. Whatever this is, he's got it. So either we believe that or we don't. You can't partially believe it. You either truly believe he's got this in this moment or he doesn't and it's out of control. And folks, if it's out of control and God doesn't have it, I don't have any word for you. I don't have any hope for you. Because if the Lord has lost control, uh, get under your desk because the atomic explosion is coming. You who are my age and older, you understand what I'm talking about. <clears throat> the USSR is going to send an atomic bomb our way, children, in first grade. Our safe place is under our school desk. We believed it. <laughs> and we practiced that a couple of times every year. It was secure under the school desk. There's great comfort and security in the sovereignty of God. Finally. Finally, the sovereignty of God on display in commissioning Israel. And that's what our passage is. Commissioning Israel to go in, take the promised land as he had said to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant, he also gave a Palestinian covenant. And in giving this, and, and I'll point this out in this message because I don't think we're going to touch on it next week, you'll notice that the tribes of Israel, the tribes of, of Jacob, of Reuben and Gad and, and Simeon and Issachar and, uh, and Judah and Benjamin and all of those, tribe of Dan, they were included, but the tribe of Joseph was substituted. Did you notice that? Substituted with what two tribes? Manasseh, firstborn, and Ephraim, secondborn. And yet their orders are reversed. Ephraim is given the place of the firstborn, the blessing, I should say, of the firstborn. Why? Because God is sovereign. Is that unprecedented? Hardly. In the book of Genesis, no less than five times, we see the firstborn being displaced by the secondborn. Abel was chosen, not Cain. Isaac was chosen, not, say it with me, Ishmael. And Esau. Oh, no, no, that's Jacob. Jacob was chosen, not Esau. Joseph was chosen, in the place of blessing, not Reuben and, and, uh, and Ephraim was chosen, not Manasseh. Why did God choose it this way? Was it because he saw something inherently good uh, in Jacob? What's Jacob's other name, his nickname? What is it? Trickster? Deceiver? Is that right? Is that what it is? No, it wasn't because of that. Uh, 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 and a, uh, uh, others. Uh, lots of sin in their lives. He did it because he wanted to. It was after his own sovereign decree. And folks, I want to add that the Lord choosing the second born uh, to have the place of blessing sure rings in our hearts as well, doesn't it? Because we were first born of whom? Adam. But that man... That old man had to die, and we had to be born a second time. And the second birth is where the birthright is, amen? <laughs> and so you were born twice. You were the second one uh, who, who was housed within your mortal body. But it's not the first birth that brings, but in fact, the first birth brings a curse because it's characterized by depravity. But the second birth, you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And you inherit all that he inherited. What is that? Eternal glory. All the wealth and blessings of heaven by virtue of being 
second born. So Ephraim was privileged uh, in being given the, the place of preeminence even though second born. Now that does not mean that we're without, without obligations or responsibilities. Truly we have those. A, a truism throughout life, Proverbs 28, 20, a faithful man shall abound with blessings. If it's unfaithful, there's going to be difficulties. There's going to be discipline. The Lord's going to deal with those who are unfaithful, just as he has all of his people throughout Scripture. But those who are characterized by walking faithfully with him, that person, those people, are going to abound with blessings. So we see in this chapter God's sovereignty on display And it is a blessing. It's a blessing that he is in control, that he's all good, all wise. I can, yea, I must trust him. I'm done with that. Now, let me ask you. If you won't trust him, what's your source of security? Do Do you have a crystal ball? Do you have... Is there a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? How about, uh, you have a lamp that you're rubbing, the genie's going to pop out? What do you hold on to for eternal life? If you drop out and walk out of here and drop dead today, how are you going to be in eternity? If he is not your Lord and your all-wise master, then that means by definition you have someone else Maybe it's even you, and and that's not going to go very far at all. Turn to the Lord today. Trust Him. Find your security, your all-sufficiency in Christ and Christ alone.